Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session of our Data Center Summit entitled Building the Foundation for AI Networks. It is sponsored by AFL. My name is Patrick McLaughlin. I'll be your moderator today. I'm with Endeavor Business Media. Before I introduce and turn things over to our expert speakers today, a little bit of housekeeping for our attendees. If you have any technical difficulties during this session, please use uh, we have some tech support behind the scenes here. We'll try to get you through whatever issues you're having. We do recommend that you disable pop-up blocking software, uh, also other extensions on your browser. Those can interfere with the performance of our player. So if you could please do that, that question window is there if you need some tech support help. That question window is also there for you to submit questions for our speakers today. We'll have a Q&A session with them to the extent that time permits after the presentation is over. So please send any questions their way, hit that submit button and we will receive them. Please know that today's session is being recorded and everybody who registered will receive a notification when the recording is available. Finally, when this session ends and when we are bidding you goodbye, you will be presented with a pop-up survey asking you to evaluate this session. We ask you to please Take that survey, take just a few seconds that are required to complete that survey. It does help us and it does inform us about what types of information and presentations to deliver to you in the future. Our speakers for this session are David Tannis, Senior Product Line Manager with AFL, and Manya Thessen, who holds the RCDD and the RTPM designations. She's a market manager for market strategy and innovation with AFL. You can learn more about each of our speakers. Uh, at the Meet the Speakers tab within your play. Today, I'm going to step out of the way and turn it over to Manya. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Patrick, for the kind introduction. And uh, all of you out there, uh, thank you for joining us. So our agenda today, uh, what I'd like to do is in the first half of our discussion, I will guide you through some essential building blocks of AI data centers, particularly focusing on large language models and the fiber optic infrastructure that's required to support the massive data processing demands of AI. We'll then delve into a blueprint for constructing a 4K AI cluster and exploring the various components and their interconnectedness. And I will also share some insights on fiber connector innovations that are essential for optimizing network performance. And then in the second half of our presentation, we'll shift towards testing the network foundation that we've built. And my colleague, David Tannis, will provide an overview of optical testing methodologies and how to set the appropriate pass-fail limits to ensure network reliability. We will also cover some essential inspection and cleaning best practices, as well as some guidelines for documenting the test results. So our hope is by the end of this session, you'll have a comprehensive understanding of the key elements involved in building an AI data center network, as well as the testing procedures that are necessary uh, to validate its performance. But first, let's zoom out a bit and examine the broader landscape of how technology has evolved to reach this point of uh, our AI era. In the cloud era, as you may have recalled, the, it really focused around applications and rapid service deployment. The focus was on utilizing scalable virtualized and software-defined infrastructure to efficiently store and retrieve structured and unstructured data. Cloud computing, virtualization, and distributed systems were the key technologies that enabled this era. However, as we shift into the AI era, our priorities are changing. The focus has now shifted towards mining intelligence from massive data sets for monetization as well as innovation. And this requires a different set of tools and technologies. Infrastructure is optimized for AI workloads with high performance computing, specialized hardware like GPUs and TPUs, as well as edge computing for real-time processing. 
we're also seeing the data itself is changing. It now consists of massive diverse data sets that are used for training our AI models, as well as real-time data streams for inference and decision-making. So this shift has led to a rise of new technologies like machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, natural language processing, and computer vision. So with this come both some challenges as well as opportunities. We'll need to address the increased demand for storage and processing power, energy efficiency concerns, as well as the need for data security. However, the AI era also offers an opportunity to really reimagine our data centers, leveraging new technologies to build smarter, more efficient infrastructures. Now let's dive deeper into the heart of AI itself. So artificial intelligence at its core is powered by artificial neural networks or ANDs. These are the fundamental building blocks that power much of the AI we see today, including these large language models like ChatGPT, which I'm sure many of you are interacting with. These networks are inspired by the intricate workings of our own brains, mimicking the interconnected neurons and their adaptive learning capabilities. So think of an AN as a network of nodes organized in layers. Each node receives input, processes it, and then passes it on to the next layer. And the connection between those nodes have what we call weights, which determine how strongly one node influences another. But the real magic of ANDs really lies in their ability to learn. Through a process called training, we expose these networks to massive amounts of data. As they analyze this data, the weights of these connections are adjusted, allowing the network to recognize patterns, make predictions, and even generate creative outputs. Today, we see ANDs with billions and even trillions of parameters, giving them the power to tackle incredibly complex tasks, from understanding human language to generating stunning images. These neural networks are pushing the boundaries of what AI can achieve. Now let's take a closer look at the sheer scale and computational demands of modern large language models. The rise of LLMs like GPT-4 is undeniable. As you can see here in the chart, the size and complexity of these models have exploded in recent years. One of the key findings from recent research is that larger models trained on more extensive data sets tend to outperform the smaller models. And this is because they can learn more complex patterns and nuances in language. And this trend is not without its challenges. As models grow larger, they require exponentially more computational power to train. And this has led to sort of an arms race in AI hardware with companies investing heavily in specialized chips such as GPUs and TPUs to stay ahead. And the case of GPT-4 illustrates this trend vividly. This model has over a trillion parameters and was trained on trillions of bytes of data. And the computational resources required to train such a model are immense, consuming several months on the world's largest supercomputing systems. So as we've discussed, the rise of AI has dramatically changed the demands placed on computing infrastructure. Here, we'll examine the stark contrast between a traditional server like the Dell PowerEdge R860 and a purpose-built AI node, the NVIDIA DGX H100. So let's start with the traditional server at the top. It's designed for general purpose computing with up to four CPU sockets and 60 cores. It has a relatively low power consumption of 750 watts and some basic networking capabilities. 
while it can handle some AI world, uh, workloads, it's not optimized for the massive parallel processing that AI models require. Now, looking at the NVIDIA DGX H100 below, this is a machine purpose built for AI. It has eight powerful GPU accelerators, each packed with over 100,000 CUDA cores and thousands of tensor cores specifically designed for AI calculations. The H100 has a power consumption of 10,200 watts, which is more than 13 times that of the R860. It also has high-speed networking capabilities to handle the massive data transfers that are involved in AI training. So the key takeaway here is the fundamental shift in data center architecture required for AI. While traditional servers remain essential for many tasks, the emergence of specialized AI nodes like the DGX H100 signifies a new era where hardware is tailored for specific workloads. Now here, I want to highlight the significant fiber optic cable requirements of GPU nodes. Traditional servers typically use one or two duplex fiber pairs. That means typically in a rack, anywhere from 48 to 64 fibers. Now, by contrast, the DGX H100 with its eight GPUs and two CPUs requires 96 fibers per server. It's an eight rack unit system and has eight MPO8 connections for the AI network and up to four more MPO connections for the client storage network. When you populate four of these servers in a rack, the fiber count quickly jumps to 384. And then when we compare this to the Grace Hopper server, connecting one GPU and one CPU, this also requires 96 fibers per server. It has 10 MPO8 connections for AI and two MPO8 connections for client storage. However, it only takes up half a two rack unit space. So notably, it can accommodate 36 servers in a rack, which increases the fiber requirement to a staggering 3,456 fibers. The images on the right provide a visual representation of these fiber connections. The top details the optical, receptacle, and channel orientation for a dual MPO connector, which is a common interface for high-speed optical transceivers used in these servers. So I want to underscore that the AI cluster network is entirely incremental, meaning that the network infrastructure must be significantly expanded to accommodate these high-performance GPU servers. Now that we've established the sheer density of fiber optic connections required for a GPU node, let's visualize the tangible impact this has on a data center's physical layout. To illustrate this, we'll compare a traditional rack of high-density servers with a rack equipped with NVIDIA H100 GPU nodes. On the left, we see a traditional high-density server rack with 36 1RU servers. This rack consumes 5.1 kilowatts of power and requires a modest 48 fibers per rack, primarily used for standard network connections. And this setup is a typical configuration found in many existing data centers today. Now, in stark contrast, the right side shows us a rack housing just two H100 GPU nodes. These nodes demand a substantial 20.4 kilowatts of power in the rack and require 144 fibers. Most of these fibers, 128 to be exact, are dedicated to the AI network. So this comparison illustrates several key points. AI workloads are significantly more power hungry, requiring substantial upgrades to power infrastructure in the data center. Traditional data centers are ill-equipped to handle the high fiber counts needed for AI clusters. Also, AI 
data centers require a complete rethinking of the network design cabling to accommodate the specialized needs of GPU accelerated computing. And then of course, the increased power and fiber requirements translate into a substantially higher total cost of ownership uh, for data centers that are AI focused. So to achieve the kind of computational power needed for groundbreaking AI research and development, we need to think big, really big. That's where the concept of a 4K cluster comes in. A 4K cluster is an AI data center comprised of 4,096 GPUs, each working in concert to process massive amounts of data and execute complex algorithms. Building such a cluster requires a meticulous blueprint, starting with a fundamental building block, a single rack housing GPU nodes. This, as we've discussed, is a power-hungry beast drawing 20.4 kilowatts of power. But what truly sets this rack apart is its connectivity requirements. 16 MPO connections for the high-speed backend network that links all of the GPUs together, and an additional two MPO connections for the front-end network, which handles the data input and output. Now let's move on to the next stage. Assembling 16 of these cabinets into a single row, each row now therefore houses 32 GPUs and consumes a substantial 326 kilowatts of power. You'll notice that there are some distinct gaps between the racks in a row. These gaps are intentional and are essential for maintaining airflow and facilitating cooling in this power dense environment. Now, as we look at the next stage in our hierarchy to connect those rows of H100 nodes, we introduce another critical building block, the tier one network switch rack. Each row in our 4K cluster has one dedicated tier one switch rack. And this rack contains eight high-speed 32-port 800 gig switches, each equipped with 64 MPO8 connections. Now, these switches provide the necessary bandwidth and low latency for efficient communication between the GPU nodes within its row. And the switches are designed to be fully non-blocking, meaning that all ports can operate simultaneously at full capacity. Half of the switch ports are dedicated to connecting downwards to the servers in their respective row, while the other half connect upwards to the next tier of switches. Each tier one switch rack supports 4,096 fibers. Compare that to 512 or 1,152 fibers that are typically handled by a traditional mid of, middle of row or end of row switch rack. That's nearly a fourfold increase. Now let's move up the network hierarchy to the tier two network rack. This is where the data is aggregated from multiple rows of H100 nodes. In our design, a single tier two switch rack serves two rows of H100 nodes. While the switch configuration is very similar, the tier two rack has 16 32 port OSFP 800 gig switches and does double the MPO density with 1024 MPO connections. Now this is essential to accommodate the combined traffic from two rows. The tier two switches maintain the non-blocking architecture and dual connectivity design with half the ports dedicated to the tier one switches below and the other half connecting upwards to the tier three switches. The total fiber count per tier two rack reaches a staggering 8,192 fibers. Now let's put it all together. So at the heart of it all, remember, is the H100 node rack. 
which houses eight GPU accelerators with two nodes per rack. We arranged 16 of these racks into a row, giving us 256 accel accelerators per row. And of course, it didn't stop there. We replicated the structure 16 times, creating 16 rows in total, ultimately reaching our target of 4,096 accelerators, which makes up a 4K cluster. Now, this translates to 23,000 MPO connections in total. If we were to stack four of these clusters together into a 16K cluster, we'd be looking at over 100,000 NPO connections in the data center. Now, as we look at the apex here, there is another building block component, and this is the tier three network switch rack. It serves as the central hub for the entire cluster consolidating the massive data flow generated by the 4,096 accelerators. This rack is equipped with 16 32-port OSFP 800 gig switches and provides 1,024 MPO ports that are dedicated strictly to aggregating connections from all eight Tier 2 switch racks in our design. All ports on the tier three switch are directed downward, connecting to the tier two switches and consolidating the vast network traffic. This design requires four tier three switch racks to support the 4K cluster's 16 rows, which results in an astonishing 32,768 fibers via those 4,096 MPO connections. This is really the culmination of all the connections from the lower tiers, creating a network that is capable of handling the massive data throughput that's required for a 4K AI cluster. Staggering, isn't it? So as we strive to build high speed, efficient and reliable networks for AI data centers, Connectors play a crucial role in ensuring the seamless connectivity. So let's explore some key advancement in this connector technology. We've seen some innovation in ultra low loss technology, ULL, which brings the same characteristics of ultra low loss single fiber LC connectors to multi-fiber MPO connectors. Fiber misalignment loss is minimized through improved mechanical tolerances, materials, and end phase polishing technologies. So when building AI infrastructure with high speed optical connectivity, there's a strong focus on increasing density and minimizing the bandwidth per square inch. So this has led to the development of small form factor connectors that offer significantly higher densities in the same space when compared to traditional LC and array style connectors. So companies like Senko or US Connect have led the charge in introducing high density micro array style connectors that can accommodate 16 or 24 fibers in a smaller footprint than their traditional MPO connector counterparts. This breakthrough along with ganged connector technology allows for substantial increase in fiber panel densities. And this addresses a growing transmission lane requirements of applications that support 800 gigabit ethernet. An example here is uh, US Connect 16 fiber MMC connector enables fitting 3,456 fibers in just one rack unit of space. This represents a threefold increase in density when you compare this to the conventional 16 fiber MPO format. So this is a significant increase in fiber density, which allows for more efficient use of space in our AI clusters, maximizing the number of fiber connections that can be supported in a single area. So it's undeniable that we're on the brink of a revolutionary time in data centers. AI is not only set to fundamentally change our society, but transform the very fabric of our data center landscape. 
AI data centers are pioneering the next generation of infrastructure, demanding low latency and high throughput. And to achieve this level of compute, we need an unprecedented level of interconnection within our data center space. And that means we're going to need more fiber, we're going to need more connections and more data centers. But it's not just about quantity, it's also about quality too. We need to ensure that our data center infrastructure can deliver the low latency and high throughput that's required. And this means investing in the right infrastructure and connectivity solutions and ensuring their performance. To speak a little bit more about this performance assurance, I'll transition to my colleague, Dave Tanis. Uh, Manya just gave us a wonderful overview of the transition and really the profound impact that moving to an AI data center has, particularly on the aspect of servers and cabling. Um, we're also seeing the same impact in other parts of the AI data center, um, certainly in the uh, power and cooling space, but it's also found its way into the fiber test environment. So just the sheer quantity of fibers that need to be tested really has put a big uh, onus on the fiber, industry, fiber test industry to come up with test solutions that can rapidly test uh, multi-fiber connectors. So we'll spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so going through uh, some of the unique contributions that the uh, fiber test industry is making to support this. Uh, some of the basic technologies around uh, testing, uh, <clears throat> the criticality of making sure that the right uh, pass-fail limits are set and that a good uh, inspection and cleaning uh, process is set. And then we'll finish up with some really best practices around reporting and documenting results. So just to start, um, and I should make the caveat that um, you know, data center test plans really vary from operator to operator, uh, but we have seen some common threads across uh, most of them. Um, one being that the fiber test equipment of choice for within the data center, what they call the white space, um, is really the uh, optical loss tests that are the ults. Um, also, you may hear the term uh, tier one certifier. Um, this refers to the piece of equipment that does the actual insertion loss testing. And then between data halls, uh, what we typically see being used is a tier two tester or an OTDR, um, which will test um, not only the, uh, the link itself, but if there are any um, high loss events along the way, we'll actually isolate and, and locate those. Um, so in the, in the uh, picture here, we see very closely spaced, really um, adjacent data halls. Um, in reality, some of these could be several kilometers away where you may actually have an intermediate splice point, um, some connectors or that. So the ability to capture and document the, uh, the full end-to-end -end path <clears throat> becomes a lot more critical uh, looking at these uh, data center interconnect links. <clears throat> so just a, a high-level view at the difference between these two pieces of equipment. Again, the... Um, the tier one ults is used primarily within the data center, uh, and this would be the tool to measure in certain loss, insertion loss, um, length of the circuit, and then polarity. Um, you'll hear a lot of times if the end user is interested in the extended warranty, the cabling provider will absolutely require that tier one test results or certification results are provided uh, before they will extend that, that warranty. Um, this is a dual-ended, as we'll see in a minute, a dual-ended test. So there's a uh, one end is acting as a light source, um, the far end that's acting as the power meter and uh, uh, measuring the received power. Um, we'll talk more about how these different systems have evolved to support uh, multi-fiber testing, but you'll see a clear evolution where, um, you know, what had been really a, 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 a serial test with um, manual um, moving through different connectors in a fan out to actual parallel testing today. And then with the OTDR, 
Um, again, this is typically used for data center interconnect links, although um, we have seen some used for some very long links within a, uh, a data hall where um, you know, there, there could be some concern over uh, extra connectors that needed to be um, troubleshot. Um, these instruments will measure insertion loss, uh, return loss, and then uh, very important, especially for the outside plant, is the ability to identify and locate uh, if there is an event uh, that has high loss. An event could be um, a connector, a splice, or a, a bend in the fiber, anything that would induce um, higher loss than the typical loss of the fiber itself. Um, these can be run single-ended, so this is one of the advantages, and you know, certainly in the, uh, the telco world, we see this being done uh, quite a bit. And there's also a migration plan for these to support multi-fiber testing as well. So also um, being able to really help out in this environment. So a little bit more detail on the uh, Ulcer Tier 1 tester. <clears throat> so we'll use this example here. This is a, a plan view of a, a five connector channel. So we have a server rack, um, connections one and two, and end of row interconnect going over to a, a full cross connect in the IDF. So um, connections three and four, and then going over to say a switch rack, uh, connection five. So the ULTS will allow us to measure the end-to-end -end insertion loss of that link. Um, it'll provide the length measurement, <clears throat> which as we'll see in a minute becomes important when you're looking at some of the different application standards that have a, um, uh, a maximum length within the typical length in a, in a data hall. And then polarity, which becomes important, especially in a link like this where you're, you've got several uh, segments and there is the possibility that um, one of these links might have the wrong polarity and that, um, that's a problem. So the ability to actually um, document and uh, indicate what the polarity is. So the ULTS is really the most, um, most accurate tool for measurement and really why uh, cabling vendors would require this for their tier one test uh, for the um, insertion loss. Um, the disadvantage, as we said, is that if there was a high loss, you know, if this did come back out of um, beyond the insertion loss limit, uh, we wouldn't really know what was causing that high loss, whether it was a bad connector, um, a, uh, uh, typically these aren't spliced, but it could be a splice in an outside plant or that. So that's really where we would rely on the, um, the OTDR to do that isolation. So what the industry has been doing really to support the um, multi-fiber testing in environment, um, which as we've seen is gonna become increasingly more critical as AI data centers are rolled out. Um, initially, if you had a cable under test that uh, say an MPO12, initially, if you were to do testing on this, you'd likely need to have a MPO to LC fan out, um, test each fiber or, or duplex, uh, go to the next pair and, and test that way. So a, literally a test that would take uh, several minutes to perform and a lot of manual activity on both ends to really do the, um, do the adjustment uh, to, or, or move to the next fiber pair. Um, this has evolved to using a, an external switch, which would basically automate that um, that uh, progression to the next fiber pair. So with this um, MPO switch and connection to the ults, you can basically go through, uh, test say fiber one and two, once that's completed, automatically move to the next pair, uh, test that, et cetera, until you got to the end of the uh, end of the link. Um, this did obviously take some time and some effort out of the testing process. You know, it cut this down to say um, one and a half minutes. Uh, the reality was this still was a serial test. So we're still testing um, one or two fibers at a time. And where the, uh, the industry is evolving to is doing a parallel test where you're actually um, running a light source through all, all the fibers in the MPO and then on the power meter side, um, measuring the results on each fiber and then generating a result. 
And this has really gotten the testing time down from you know several minutes a minute down to just a matter of a few seconds. So uh, again, the impact of this, if you think of that example Manya showed with 100,000 MPOs, you know, the impact of this is, is absolutely significant. So that's the ults. Um, if we move over to the data center interconnect, which is again, <clears throat> typically tested with an OTDR. Um, the OTDR is a, a single-ended tester. So this basically, uh, <clears throat> provided you're using the right uh, launch conditions, uh, connecting to the, uh, the network under test. And this will do a full profile of what that, um, what that fiber links looks like. So um, it will identify um, high loss activities, whether events such as splices, um, uh, intermediate connectors, any any bending along the way. And again, if the <clears throat> limit is showing a fail, um, it, it'll actually identify uh, where that is. And the technology has really um, evolved and made it much simpler to actually interpret the results um, in the earlier versions of, of this product, you know, um, it was pretty complicated sometimes to read what the trace looked like. Uh, the newer versions will provide this very easy to interpret um, link map, which will identify uh, the different types of events, again, connectors, splices or that. And <clears throat> with the thresholds that can be set on each one of these events will actually indicate whether or not the, um, the events were good or, or need to be redone. So um, significant improvement on those. And why, you know, why we're seeing this moving into the the need to have multi-fiber testing, um, we're seeing a lot of cases where this data center interconnect cable, um, really in, in, a, in an effort to reduce installation time and, and speed things up, will either be terminated at both ends and uh, basically the assembly, you know, pulled through one end uh, through the duct, or if there isn't sufficient space in the duct, uh, one end would be terminated and then the uh, the blunt end uh, would be spliced to splice on connectors. So uh, regardless of how they get there, the need is really to do testing uh, in a multi-fiber environment with a uh, an OTDR. So the, um, the technology like with the ults has evolved to where, you know, initially we saw the need to do this testing with a fan out and uh, manually progress through the different fibers. So basically move, um, you know, as you're testing each individual fiber, you know, manually go to the next one, do the measurement and then uh, manually change. And then uh, newer testers will actually have an external um, MPO switch, which will automate this, this testing process to where um, once the first one is set up, it'll just manually cycle through all the fibers in the MPO uh, from MPO8 up to, uh, you know, we're seeing MPO24. Um, the technology really hasn't lent itself yet to where it's practical to do a parallel OTDR test, uh, just based on the cost and the complexity of the circuitry. Um, but with the serial test and the switch, the test times have really been able to uh, come down significantly from how these were being done in the uh, in the manual stage. So that's a quick look at the equipment that's being used. Um, one of the key things, whether you're using an OTDR or an ULS, is to set the right test limit. So this is really the decision of what is considered uh, a pass or a fail. And uh, again, this, this applies to both uh, ULS and OTDR. And there's a number of different ways to do this. Um, you know, from a standards point of view, there are application standards. Uh, most, most commonly used are the Ethernet um, 802.3 or IEEE 802.3 standards, which are based on a given speed and a um, you know, specific transceiver technology have limits on the maximum loss that that link can have or the maximum length um, that that link can be, that, um, link can be uh, to support the, uh, the application. Um, some examples below, um, 100G base LR, uh, 400G, 800G, they have standards um, currently being looked at up to 1.6 terabits. So that's looking at the application. 
Uh, there are also standards looking at the performance and really the um, uh, deployment of the actual cable itself. So uh, the cabling standards most commonly seen are the TIA uh, 568. Uh, there's a typo here, it should be ISO IEC 11801 and then Senelec 50173. These are standards that really define <clears throat> what the ma maximum loss of different events are. So they set a maximum loss for a, um, a particular connector, a maximum loss for the fiber that, that's involved in a link, and then not commonly seen in most data centers, but um, maximum fiber displace loss. So those are those are two really standards-based um, uh, limits that can be set. Uh, the other is a user-defined limit. Um, so we're seeing uh, some of the operators that are coming up with their own limits. Uh, they could be um, like the applications based on a maximum loss and or maximum length, or they could have maximum loss uh, of the individual events uh, within that link. So um, all different varieties there. So, you know, going back to the earlier example that we had, where if we we're looking at this, um, you know, five uh, MPO12 connectors in a link uh, that we're doing testing on, if we were to test this um, to the uh, application standard of 400G base DR4, uh, this standard has a maximum insertion loss of 3 dB, uh, maximum length of 500 meters, and you know this particular transceiver uses eight um, eight fibers in a MPO12 profile. So um, if the testing is done and you're below the uh, the three dB limit or the 500 and the 500 meters, um, you're good to run this. And the nice thing about this, uh, the uh, 802.3 has done a very good job as they've developed higher speed standards to make sure that. Um, if you start at a certain lower speed, so you know we think of this example, if your initial data center is being deployed with 400 G base DR4 at the three dB limit and 500 meters, if in a few years time, you decide to upgrade to 800 gig, uh, 800 G base DR4, uh, there is an application spec set to support that at the same three dB upper limit and, and 500 meters. So. Um, it's a good way to really look at, at future proofing your network. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind a lot of, in a lot of cases going to the higher speeds in an effort to keep the cost of the transceivers down, um, these tend to need uh, higher fiber counts. So this is one of the reasons as, you know, Manya went through the different connector types that we're seeing. This is one of the reasons we're seeing a bigger push towards the um, MMC 16 or 16 fiber connectors, uh, they can support, um, you know, basically a transition from uh, some applications that need four fibers to eight fibers to 16 fibers. So um, we're continuing to see more of these, you know, very high density connectors uh, with the uh, anticipation that they're going to be used to support even higher speeds of, um, of uh, applications. So an, another way to look at setting the test limits is with one of the cabling standards. So we talked about this, um, <clears throat> the TIA, uh, so the 568-3-E. Uh, this defines a maximum loss per connector of 0.75 dB, uh, fiber loss of 0.4 dB per kilometer, 1310. So <clears throat> if we calculate out this out based on the five connector channel, um, 100 meters long, the uh, upper limit for this would be 3.79 dB. So this would, um, if you were to test this, this, and you got below this limit, this would assure that you've got, um, you know, that this link is supporting um, per the standard. So one of the one of the common um, sources of confusion when when people look at that, say that TIA limit, and they say, well. If I've got my 400 gig channel that I want to run and I look at the TIA limit, well, that's 3.79 dB. That's more than the uh, the maximum amount that the 400G DR4 standard can can, um, can tolerate. 
So one, one thing to keep in mind, when these standards are set, because they're set per connector, um, they're always looking at the worst case. Um, so the, the worst case out of any of those 12 fibers uh, would be 0.75 dB. So what happens when you concatenate several of these together, the, uh, the probability of having the, you know, the worst case or higher loss on each one of these fibers is very, very low. And the reality is when you're doing testing on this link, you know, it will, um, you know, unless, unless there's some serious issues that, you know, it would come in to where you should be able to meet the application standard. So it's important when you're looking at setting the standard to understand um, what's being run and what, what kind of loss that particular application can, uh, can tolerate. So that's testing. Um, the other important thing to look at, again, just looking at the types of speeds that these networks are running is having a good way to inspect and clean connectors. So this has been a, um, an issue from the very start. And you know, when you think of really all the different ways that a, a network can, uh, can run into problems, you know, lots of hardware issues, power issues, uh, software issues, um, Thankfully, we don't see a lot of this because uh, networks have been designed with resilience, but um, there are cases where we do see networks going down. And in spite of all these different ways, time and time again, <clears throat> you know, uh, a lot of studies and a lot of um, field experience has really shown that uh, dirty connectors uh, continue to be right at the top of the list. So um, a lot of times, and especially in some of these larger installations, uh, the consensus is there really isn't time to do a lot of inspection and cleaning, um, but the reality is that uh, this is and will continue to be one of the biggest issues that's that's being faced in um, reducing network outages. So especially in the data center, you know, we've seen uh, some myths around um, why we don't need to do this. Uh, probably the biggest one is the fact that uh, within the white space, most of the cabling being deployed is pre-terminated cable. Um, it comes with dust caps or should come with dust caps, test reports in a nice plastic bag. The assumption is when you pull this thing out and, and um, you know, put it in the containment, snap it in place, uh, it should be good to go. It, you know, it should be pristine and there should be no issues around um, connector cleanliness. The reality is, is that um, these uh, cable assembly houses are not in a clean room environment. And we'll see time and time again, you know, as these um, either components or cables come out, um, you'll you'll find dirty connectors. So in, in this case, this was a random LC MPO module that we had to look at. Um, we saw contamination on some of the MPO ports as, or um, on the uh, some of the LC ports, as well as contamination on the MPO port. So um, even though, again, even though these are coming right from the factory, it's still very important to uh, inspect and clean these to make sure that they're, uh, they're ready to go when the network is turned up. Um, and then another myth some people are, are under is that the data center itself is a clean room environment. And um, anyone that's been in one uh, probably feels otherwise. You know, they tend to be... Uh, very noisy. They have a tremendous amount of air movement just to uh, cool all the uh, IT equipment. And the actual ratings, um, there is actually an ISO rating for different um, different environments. The actual rating for a typical data center is in the uh, what they call category seven or eight range, which in the eight, um, this allows, you could see up to 29,000 uh, five micron particles floating around in a, a cubic meter of air. And if you think about it, just one of those, if that lands on the uh, the core of a fiber, you know, that could be enough to contaminate it and cause a, uh, cause a network outage. So um, again, the importance of a, a good inspection and good cleaning practice is, uh, is critical for these data centers. So the, uh, again, the test and inspection industry has been um, also designing products to support this. So there's uh, a lot of um, very high quality digital microscopes on the market that will allow, you know, very good imaging of, in this case, an MMC 16 
So looking at the overall um, connector itself, um, there's also obviously the um, uh, IEC rules to actually do the analysis of each one of the end faces, uh, determine which ones pass and which ones fail. And then the, um, the reporting software that will actually go in, um, you know, provide a report on the uh, fiber end face and then identify based on IEC rules uh, what the nature of the failure was, you know, the size and the zone that the, uh, the contaminant was in. So important rules around that. And certainly on the cleaning side, there's been um, new cleaners designed in this, this um, uh, industry accepted a, a push or, or one click uh, form factor that would allow uh, basic cleaning of MMC 16, 24 or, or other um, multi-fiber connectors, um, as well as well-established practices for, um, for cleaning, whether you're doing a, a dry clean or a wet clean, um, how to actually perform that. So uh, important part of the, uh, the fiber maintenance practice. And then finally, you know, looking at reporting, um, again, this is critical really for the, uh, the contractor to get paid. They have to be able to generate a report showing the results of their testing. And we've really seen, uh, I guess, two different models in, in terms of how this should be done. We have some, we have seen some uh, end users that uh, will not allow any any wireless support or any wireless um, capabilities of, of the tester and would require the tester to transfer results via USB. Um, we've seen really the, uh, the opposite approach where the actual USB ports are locked down and they require everything to be done uh, wirelessly. So whether it's, um, you know, through an app with a Bluetooth or uh, through Wi-Fi, but um, you know, a well-designed tester really needs to be able to support both environments. Uh, so, with that, just in conclusion, again, um, you know, we've seen, you know, from the uh, the tremendous impact that AI has on uh, the infrastructure within a uh, an AI data center, and really the uh, the tools that are being designed to help. Uh, help operators and contractors uh, do very, very quick and uh, very effective fiber testing and inspection. So with that, I will, I will conclude and uh, turn back to you, Patrick. David, thank you very much. Manya, thank you very much for all that information. Uh, we do have some time for audience questions. Thank you for um, for leaving that time in our hour here. I'd like to start, Manya, I think I'd like to start with a few questions for you, our first presenter. Um, one asks about edge computing. What role do you think that edge computing will play in supporting the growth of AI networks, which you described? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. So edge computing actually is a partner of AI in, in the sense that uh, it's very critical in the inference or actually the decision-making process. So we talked a lot today about training models, large language models, uh, which requires a lot of the robust infrastructure, the clusters we talked about today. But the decision-making actually happens a lot closer to the user. Uh, so whether that's on the device itself or somewhere close to where the decision-making happens on a, on a manufacturing floor, for example. So edge computing will be critical in that arena. Uh, and then also as we kind of look at the uh, cloud, cloud data centers being more sophisticated, edge computing will be a component of the cloud data center as well, just to ensure the uh, low latency transfer of information back to the user. Well, thank you. Uh, another question for you, Manya. You, you talked about some pretty staggering numbers, uh, number of fibers in, in AI networks. So how do these massive fiber counts that you mentioned impact the design and the deployment of this AI data center infrastructure? And, you know, what, what are the implications for data center deployment of these massive numbers you've been talking about? 
Yes, uh, definitely something that uh, a uh, AFL uh, wakes up to in the morning and, and ponders. Uh, so, so you know, big big question is how can we make it easier to deploy all of these massive uh, amounts of fiber connections? Uh, certainly, it starts with the, the manufacturer. Uh, so, so as we look at these large uh, fiber counts within trunks, really being able to take that off of the site and the installer and actually produce these components, those cable assemblies in a controlled environment uh, with the enhanced quality controls in place, uh, it, it will continue to aid uh, the expeditiousness that data centers are being deployed today. So, so the speed of deployment is, is certainly impacted by just, just the sheer amount. Um, as you can also imagine, David touched on the, uh, the, the testing requirements. So we also have to think about how do we assure the performance? Even though those uh, cable assemblies came off of a manufacturing line, they still need to be, be tested and inspected to ensure that once they go into uh, a live environment that they perform as function. And then we get into the data center uh, design aspect. Obviously, we have to closely consider space constraints. Not only do we have additional uh, amounts of fiber connections, cables, uh, small com smaller components to, to worry about, which require uh, really fully thought through fiber, fiber routing and uh, rack designs, but we're also competing against increased power requirements. So you've got increased power connections to the cabinet. You've got uh, new changes in the way we cool the environment. For example, liquid cooling to the rack uh, requires additional infrastructure that now competes with, with the cable routing into, into the space. So a lot to consider and, and think through upfront to ensure that all of the uh, infrastructure is able to uh, perform as, as designed. So there's a lot of additional upfront design and consideration needed here. And also in one of the examples that I showed, really the, the gaps that we saw where empty racks were in between the, uh, the server racks that we showed. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration because we can't uh, just continue to populate racks and add as needed as we've done so in the past. So a lot, a lot of planning has to go into this to make sure we consider all of the aspects of the infrastructure, not just the fiber connections themselves. Thank you. Um, I'd like to send one more your, your way, Manya. Uh, NVIDIA, which uh, was part of, of your uh, part of your presentation, an, an attendee points out NVIDIA just rolled out, and I'm just reading here, um, GB200 super chips. They are ganged in the grace of Blackwell powered DGX SuperPod. Now, during the rollout, uh, it was noted that a, a significant power reduction is inherent in, um, in that rollout. Um, can you sort of help frame that for us? Uh, you know, if, if these chips and, and what NVIDIA is putting out is, is becoming uh, more power efficient, how does that compare, or does that affect the type of build that you described in your presentation? It, it absolutely does. So uh, that definitely NVIDIA is moving in the right direction. They're, they're, they're solving the power, power issues that we have. So just a little bit of reading up that I've done on the, on the same uh, news announcements. I understand they're expecting about a 30X performance improvement. Uh, compared to their previous hopper architecture iteration. So, so that's, that's significant, right? So, so they can do a lot more in compute power uh, in the same space and it, that, than their, the, the prior hopper uh, Blackwell or the hopper, Grace Hopper architecture. Uh, and they're touting they can do it with 25 uh, percent less energy. So that's uh, that's significant in itself. So you get 30, 30 times more compute at 25 percent less energy. So if we kind of were to put this into uh, an example here, so when previously required 8,000 GP, Hopper GPUs uh, at 15 megawatts of power, 
this can be now accomplished with 2000 Blackwell GPUs using just four megawatts of power. So, so this is this is significant. Of course, this has to be tested in the real in environment. So this is uh, what the NVIDIA tout touted, but it is significant. So if we were to look at our, our design, certainly the, the power requirement would be a lot less. Um, you would also be able to uh, do more aggressive uh, compute with the infrastructure that you have in place. I have not seen any specifics around the, the fiber connections that are required there. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what the, uh, you know, obviously you're doing more compute, so you have to also also transfer it and transfer the data uh, accordingly. So that, that remains to be seen. So I have no, no feedback on what that means from a fiber connection standpoint. Thank you, Manya. Thank you very much. And, and David, thank you. I know we're right at time. I know that there are still a few questions out there. Just want to let members of our audience know that if you submitted a question that we were not able to address here today, please know that that question has been captured and retained. I'm not going to promise that you'll be receiving a response, but there is a possibility that if there's a question left on the table, so to speak here, you may be hearing a follow-up um, from uh, from an expert on that. So thank you very much to members of our audience for, for tuning in. Thanks to David and, and Manya for this session. Thanks to AFL for sponsoring it. Um, I will remind every member of our audience that we are going to present to you in just a moment a pop-up survey asking you to evaluate this session. Please do complete that evaluation. It does uh, influence what type of information we deliver to you in the future. My thanks to AFL, to Manya and David for this presentation on a fascinating topic. And uh, thanks to members of our audience who joined us today. Our data center, data center summit continues tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern with more sessions. You can bet AI will be part of the conversation as well as many other topics as well. So please join us then if you have the opportunity. We thank you for joining us today. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.